Hello, everyone. Depending on where you're located, good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Achieving Closed Loop Firewall Automation with Batfish Enterprise and iTensil. As a quick introduction, my name is Mike Elrom. I'm a senior solutions architect at iTensil, and I'm joined today by Samir Parikh from IntentionNet. I'm excited to be able to share our solution with you today. I've been doing network automation for over 20 years, and it's never been easier. I remember the days of writing custom Java code to invoke SSH sessions for devices, manage database connections for inventory, and execute Perl scripts for IPM. We've come a long way as an industry with DevOps tools and Python, but today we get to share with you an even easier way to automate. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Samir Parikh. I'm head of product at IntentionNet. Super excited to be here at this webinar. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm really excited to share uh, our joint vision of how we can help you enable your on, enable you on your next DevOps journey uh, by combining the power of automation and the power of validation. Thanks, Samir. I'm excited to jump into today's topic of automating the entire process of closed loop policy configuration management. But before we get started, I'd like to discuss a few housekeeping points. First off, everyone on the webinar will be muted. If you have any questions along the way, please drop them into the questions panel, which you can find under the webinar, and we will cover them during our Q&A session at the end. And third, if, you don't get to, if we don't get to all the questions in this webinar, we will answer them via email shortly after the webinar. So for today's agenda, we'll introduce you to the iTensil Automation Platform and Batfish Enterprise. We'll talk about automation combined with validation, and we'll give you a demo of our solutions, as well as a use case demonstration pertaining to a firewall policy. What I love about the iTensil Automation Platform is that it's been purpose-built to allow anyone to automate. It makes it simple. You don't have to be a programmer, and you definitely don't need to train your network engineers to become software engineers. iTensil can integrate into anything so your teams can build automation use cases for truly end-to-end -end processes, maximizing the value of automations, and then you get to expose those automations for consumption through a number of different methods. iTensil's architecture is one of my favorite things that I get to share with folks. This is where we'll explain how iTensil solves network automation. I'll begin by explaining the architecture drawing from bottom up. When we say we connect into everything, we really mean it. We leverage iTensil's adapter framework and iTensil's automation gateway to do that. The adapters focus on connections in the controllers, orchestrators, and other IT systems such as inventory, ticketing, and messaging. Connections generally consist of REST, SOAP, NetConf, gRPC, and database protocols. The automation gateway allows iTensil to talk to devices and other components such as Ansible modules and playbooks, Terraform plans, and even scripts. Now, most folks will tell you if you wanna automate, step one is to suck in network data so we can make business process decisions. But iTensil solves this problem differently. We federate data and we make real-time API calls using our adapters and our gateway. This is really important. This allows you to bring iTensil into your environment without locking your teams out from their tool sets. Since iTensil federates data, we talk to the systems just like your engineers do. You could even think of iTensil as an extension of your team. The next challenge becomes how to take data from one system and transform it into data that the next system needs. This is where the data transformation layer comes in. It's a set of tools such as iTensil's JSTs, JSON schema transformation, Jinja templates, and other data, man data manipulation tools. So now that you can connect into everything and federate data and transform it, the fun part begins. Moving into the automation studio, this is where teams use drag and drop to build their business process workflows for their use cases. This is a combination of actions into your systems, so the adapters and automation gateway we spoke about earlier, plus the data transformations, which allow you to transform the data as you move it from one system to the next. The most important skill set needed here is the understanding of your business process, not software development. With Configuration Manager, you get to see a federated view of your network devices and perform common operations, such as viewing device configurations, taking backups, and building golden configurations so that you can understand compliance and even remediate your network configuration. Finally, at the top of the architecture, you can expose your potential work through the self-service catalog entries our REST API, or triggers such as network events, schedules, and webhooks. Batfish Enterprise is network validation. Uh, you know, Batfish Enterprise enables you to validate your network before you make changes by creating a digital twin of your infrastructure completely in software. And 
using our modeling technology, we predict the impact of the change, and then we provide a no-code network uh, policy specification language for you to interact with these models and tell us what the correct behavior is for your network. At a high level, we've been around, the Batfish Enterprise has been commercially available since 2018. And, but the actual genesis of Batfish Enterprise and the core technology starts uh, back at Microsoft Azure many, many years ago, where they wanted to adapt formal verification techniques that are used in hardware and software on a wide basis for networking so that we can predict the impact of any change before it's made. So I'll give you a high level overview of how it works. At a high level Batfish Enterprise, it starts by analyzing your production config. So you ingest, you import these production configs, and as you can see, as a wide variety of vendors and platforms that are supported, from firewalls to load balancers, from all the popular vendors you expect us to see, uh, to public clouds like AWS. You marry that with the service and network intent policies uh, that we have a very, like I mentioned, a no code framework to sort of specify those. You then layer on the changes you want to make, and these changes could be done directly in our UI, or it can be, or they can come in through any sort of automation, uh, like IAP, for instance, which we'll show you here today. And then Batfish Enterprise takes these uh, these inputs and ultimately generates a change report card for you, telling you, you know, if this change is passing all your requirements, passing all the policies, passing all your tests, or not. And and any time there's a failure, you get very detailed information about what's failing. So that gives you enough information to go back and iterate on that change until everything passes. And then you can use these signals either in your manual change uh, management process or in an automated one, which we're gonna show you here today, to make a decision on should you deploy this change or not. Uh, and that's really the power of using validation and power of Batfish Enterprise that lets you sort of pull all these things together. And this is where, when we talk about automation and validation and closing the loop, you know, this is the ultimate power. By combining these two things together, we can allow your, you to increase your velocity of changes on your highly scaled infrastructure while also eliminating downtime. You know, and closing the loop with automation and validation, this is how we see how we can help you improve your, improve your MTBF so we can improve your mean time between failures, not just sort of focus on mean time to repair. Because at the end of the day, you know, rather than remediating things quickly, the best outcome is if you actually just don't have the outage to begin with. And so that's the real quick focus for us. And that's the power of automation plus validation. For those new to iTential, you're probably wondering what a pre-built is. In the architecture of iTential, we talked about how the platform can automate use cases. The goal of a pre-built is simply to reduce time to value. A pre-built comes in the form of adapters, transformations, and even entire automations. You have the option to start with a blank canvas, but you can also pull a pre-built into your iTential automation platform so you have somewhere to start from and then stitch those together like Lego blocks as you're building a larger automation. Itential and IntentionNet have worked together to create Batfish Enterprise Itential pre-builds. The first is an adapter that will connect Itential into Batfish Enterprise through their gRPC API. And the second is an automation that analyzes a change reviews results. Today's use case demonstration will show you how you can implement a firewall policy into a Palo Alto firewall. Typically it takes organizations week to make, weeks to make this kind of change. The change time is actually just a few minutes. Network engineers understand that and they do that on a day-to-day -day basis. But due to organizational inefficiencies and manual processes, changes are delayed. We're gonna show how an end-to-end -end automation that sends Slack notifications, creates and updates change requests, performs pre and post validation using Batfish enterprises and policies, and updates configuration in the Palo Alto firewall can show you how we can take that time into just a matter of minutes. All right, so I've begun sharing some of my Chrome tabs now. I first wanna catch everyone up with the Itential pre-built since we had covered that on a couple slides ago. So onto the itential.com site, and if I pop over into our pre-built collection, we can see the, the pre-builds that we'll be using in today's demonstration. We've got the adapter. Again, this is the Batfish Enterprise gRPC adapter that lets us connect and communicate with Batfish APIs. And then we've got the Batfish Enterprise change review results automation that will be part of our demo today in our use case demonstration. I'm gonna jump into the Itential automation platform. And as I start out, first I'm gonna go a little bit different from our architecture discussion. I'll go top level down and I'll pop over into configuration manager.
All right, this is the federated view of devices through our adapters. This is where you get to view device configuration, traditional or cloud networks, take backups of devices, and even build golden configuration for compliance and remediation. For today's demonstration, we'll be using the Firewall 01, which is actually a Palo Alto firewall. All right, next I'm popping into Operations Manager. This is where you expose those operations, those automations via self-service, REST APIs, network events, schedules, or webhooks. You can see metrics about your automations and you can see how they are performing against targeted SLAs. All right, inside Automation Studio, this is where you build business processes to execute actions. Data federation and data transformations are big players here. <clears throat> I've started out by creating a blank canvas here just to show you how easy it is to, to build stuff. On the left side, you'll see a list of our automations that are already existing in our platform. You'll also see other tool sets on the bottom that can be used for automation processes, such as templates, forms, and JSTs. On the right side, we've got tasks. These are the different applications and adapters that we're connected to. And then in the center, we have our canvas. I'm gonna start pulling in just a few things that are relevant to our demonstration, just to show you how easy it is. So inside of our Slack integration, I can search for particular components. So if I wanted to send a message in Slack, I can pop that onto the canvas. If I want to create a change request in ServiceNow, I can search for that and add that to the canvas. And then if I wanted to do something inside of Batfish, I could pull that as well. And then building an automation, again, just knowing the process and how you do this makes it really simple to, to uh, have those automations created. I'm going to pop into our pre-built next and get you up to speed on that. So this is the actual pre-built that IntentionNet and Itential have worked together on to create. Samir, I'll give you an opportunity to go over the process. Thanks, Mike. Like Mike mentioned, what we're trying to do with this pre-built is we've got these underlying gRPC APIs that are exposed through the adapter. But you know, those are just the APIs. You need logic and business uh, and a workflow around it. And this is what this one pre-built does. You know, allows us to interact with the change review that's been created, uh, and which we'll show you in the broader context of the demo in a second. And what you're seeing here is we're getting data back from Batfish using this adapter, and then we're using the different tools and techniques that Itential has to evaluate the data we get back, make decisions, okay, is this a pass or a fail? If it's a fail, I can, I'm gonna take one action. If it's a pass, I'm gonna take a different action. And then every time, if I pass, then I go to the next stage, where you know, once I see that the change review is complete, for instance, I have that eval, I'm gonna look for the status of these test cases. I'm gonna loop through all the test cases. If all of them pass, then I'll look for policies. If any of them fail, then I'll sort of hit the, the failure path on the top there. And I just sort of work my way through evaluating all the information I need from Batfish using these adapters and then using uh, the constructs like JSTs and queries and evals that uh, Itential uh, gives you on this canvas. And in the end, the sort of whole workflow is designed to give you this sort of binary signal saying, okay, did my change if you pass or did it fail? Uh, but you can see in this logic, it's not just I'm making an API call and dumping the data back to you. You in these in these pre-built, you get to embed logic, you get to embed pass file criteria, you get to evaluate for error conditions, you get to handle all these different scenarios you might expect to see. Uh, and that's really the power of the pre-built is like you get the underlying APIs, but by building this pre-built, we just feel like it's going to be a lot easier for our customers to integrate this into their workflow. Thanks, Samir. So I had a couple other things as comments there. As Samir mentioned, we did different things such as the evaluation, decision points. These are really important because as you go through your automation, you wanna set up different conditions on how you can do things and how you can respond based on the conditions inside of the automation. So with Samir's team building these pre-builds and getting them into the Itential platform, as he mentioned, we can make those decision pads along the way. 
as we do different decisions, we're basing that based on data that we've learned within the automation. And as we execute those different gRPC calls, when I open up these tasks, it's not a set of, um, of just code that you have to pass through. It's actually grabbing data from one of the prior tasks. So as you start stringing these together, it makes it really easy to build your automations um, in, a, in an incremental manner. The hard part, as I mentioned, is once you can talk to all these different systems, is how do you federate, how do you uh, transform data? And again, that's why we've got these blocks in here called JSTs. So in this particular JST, we're actually passing data that we learned within the automation to a drag and drop template of transform, transforming data so that we can pass it into another task. If I pop over to the transformations block here, and I'll pull up this JST here. <clears throat> This is actually the JST that gets called behind the scenes there on that task. So we pull in the change review metadata that we learned at, through, from one of the gRPC calls within the automation, and then we're setting it up so that later on as we measure our policies it, within Batfish, we wanna compare what, what are the policy tests outcome within the uh, prior to our change, and after we propose the change to Batfish, what, is the, uh, what are the policies gonna look like after? So we pull out <clears throat> from the change review, we pull out the network name, the base snapshot name and the change snapshot name, and then we pass those into the automation as their own objects so that when we go back to the automation flow, we can call the list policy results metadata with both the base information and the change information. So I think that's enough overview. I'm gonna hop into our use case demonstration for firewall for the firewall policy change. So to do that, I'm gonna pop back over to operations manager this time I'm going to select our firewall rule. And I'll choose the manual trigger that we set up. Again, just as a reminder, this could be a northbound API, could be an event you're listening to, could be a number of different ways you schedule these automations. For today's demonstration, we're going to do a manual form. We've got this pre-populated with some values for our test case today, for our use case. And then at the bottom here, I've got a flag set for auto approval. We learned from within the automation and within the pre-builds, we're measuring success and failure. So we could give this an opportunity to go completely end to end without any pausing. But for today's demonstration, we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of pause in the middle. So we'll leave the auto approve off. I'm gonna start that automation and jump into the job. So the particular job is the instance of the automation as it's executing. You may have heard some Slack notifications coming through. So I'll pop into my Slack window we can already see that the change request has been initiated and we get a link back to our potential automation. And we can see that the change request has been created in service now, so I can pop in there as well. So this is a change request as it's loading that's gonna be used within our automation. We've set this up so that it's able to create the change request and continuously update the change request in both Slack and ServiceNow uh, so that we're able to see the information as the automation progresses. Hopping back inside of Itential, I'm going to click on Visualize to jump back into the flow here. This is our top-level automation. As a best practice, we've set up and made this really reusable so that our network change is just a task in the middle of our automation. We've got this set up in a repeatable modular framework so that every change activity that we're doing in this workflow could be a could follow the same process. So Slack messages, change requests, and so on. I'm gonna jump into the firewall use case. And this is actually where the network changes are orchestrated together. Just to catch everyone up, the first thing we did was execute a firewall check policy. So what this does is go into Batfish and creates the change request review, setting up the specifics for the firewall. Once we've set that up, the next thing we do is we embed the automation that we talked about earlier for the potential pre-built. So this is the Batfish Enterprise change review results. So this time when I pop in here, as opposed to the view earlier, the workflow itself looks very similar, but we can see the path lit up in a certain manner of the automation and how it progressed based on the data conditions. So what that means is we've taken the successful path all the way through. We never reached any of the error states so all the evaluation decisions have passed successfully. We talked about the JST earlier, so I'll pop back in here. 
This is the actual data that we sent in and we received back out from Batfish Enterprise. So that transformation occurred and we were able to push this data into some of the tasks going down the path here. This part's really cool here because this is where we evaluate the policy. As mentioned, so Batfish is measuring a set of rules that Samir will get into in just a few moments, and he'll be able to show you the different policies that we're, we're evaluating and measuring against. Inside of here, we took the logic that came back out of Batfish Enterprise from a statistics perspective, and based on that data, we decided everything was in a proper condition to move this forward without any issues, and we exited this pre-built with a successful condition. Doing that as we climb back up into our automation, we're able to pass that successfully here, which takes us down the success route on our firewall use case. So instead of our firewall use case, we've taken the decision and said, look, on the initial intake data, we did want to pause for approvals. So it's gone into this manual approval step here for some user intervention. And I think this is a good opportunity for us to uh, pop over to Batfish. So I'll stop sharing and Samir can give us a demonstration of Batfish Enterprise to see what's been going on behind the scenes. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, so this is what the Batfish Enterprise dashboard looks like when you first log in. Uh, what you have is sort of a series of snapshots. So this is the configurations and the view of Batfish uh, has built for your network at one point in time. So here it's from the 28th of September. Uh, and what you see here is the topology that Batfish has rendered. So remember I said, Batfish takes your network data, your config configuration information and builds a model. And so we build this model of the network, in this case, a small data center. I've got a couple of Juniper MX border routers, a Palo Alto firewall, which is the key part of this uh, change request we're gonna use. And then I've got uh, a leaf spline system uh, built on Arista switches. And so this gets built and rendered every time there's a new snapshot. But what I wanna pop over to real quick is let's look at our change review process. So as you can see through the automation, uh, using our APIs, we've created a new change review. So ticket one, open access for service one. So both of those things should have been familiar in that form that Mike showed you. And so now when I dive into this change review, uh, what this workflow is designed to do is sort of mimic what you would be doing in a maintenance window where you've got a mop that says run these commands on these devices. It's got pre-checks and post-checks and test conditions. And so we wanted to give you a workflow in our UI that allowed you to mimic those core aspects of your maintenance window, uh, but do it in our software system completely offline so you don't have to worry about impacting anything in production and get to make sure your changes are correct. So this config that we see here, this is what was generated by the automation. It took that user input uh, and used a series of Jinja templates to decide, hey, this is what the config needs to be on the firewall if we wanted to enable this change request. Yeah. The cool thing about this is so just like this came in through automation, you can actually just type stuff over here. Uh, I can type commands as I go, and I'm gonna get command completion. Uh, I'm gonna get a lot of other insights into if, it's a, if the syntax is correct or incorrect. Here, obviously the, the line is incomplete. That's why it shows up as incorrect. Uh, and so this window here is actually a lightweight IDE, and you're basically gonna interact with it like you interact with the console on a router or firewall itself. So I have this change that's been proposed. But the other cool thing about doing sort of having pre-built automations for, especially for common tasks, is along with the workflow to consume the information to build the change, you can also build test cases. And so in this instance, we've built two test cases. Uh, the first one is what we call our cross zone policy flow filtering test case. Uh, and this is one of the, the sort of no code pr policy primitives that we provide in Batfish. And the point of this is to understand the behavior of a firewall policy. So let me show you what that looks like by showing you the form. Uh, again, you can do this all through YAML or JSON, but if you want to build it interactively, you can use this form builder. Uh, what this po policy is doing is you're telling it, okay, on firewall one, I want to ensure that this set of flows, in this case, I got one flow defined going to two slash 24s over TCP 443 from out zone outside to zone inside. So something that's originating outside my network going inside. I want that flow to be permitted. So this is what you want to have happen after the change. And so that's why I have this thing that says, after the change, this test should pass. And that's my post check, right? So that's my post change check. Make sure that once I deploy this change, the file is gonna allow this flow. But the other thing I get to do is I also get to specify a pre-change check, which is what's happening before the change. And in this scenario, I'm saying this should fail. And by fail, I mean, you know what? If 
this flow should get dropped until I make that change. And the reason this is important is because if the flow is already allowed, uh, if the firewall is already permitting that flow, then you wouldn't need this change. And so if you didn't need this change, that is telling you one of a few things. One is either that the requester gave you wrong information on the input, in which case this is great, we caught that, so we're, uh, we can go back to them and say, hey, you know, something's wrong with your input, uh, revise and resubmit. Or something got messed up in the generation of the config, whether it's the template or something else, so we can go back and debug that. Or the third thing is uh, maybe the network has just been overly permissive and we didn't know it. Uh, and so we've been sort of letting in more traffic than we should have, sort of opening up to some potential security breaches. And then again, we now know this and we'll go dig, we can dig into that and try to tighten that uh, up. But either way, this sort of this precondition is just as important as the post condition. And so when I look at that, what Batfish tells me very clearly is, hey, before the change, we told it this ch test should fail and it failed. So that's a green. After the change, we said it should pass and it passed. And then you also get insight into why it passed or why it failed. You'll get an example flow and you'll and it will understand what the filter trace was. So which rules were matched, why they were matched, et cetera. So you can say I matched this rule ticket one because I matched this ad, uh, address group, et cetera. And I can see obviously this is the change I defined. I had a new rule called ticket one, this new address group called ticket one dash def. So that's all great. So at this stage, I know the firewall policy change is gonna do what it wants to do. But that's generally also not enough, right, to make sure that this change is, is correct and it's going to have the intended outcome. What I also want to make sure is uh, I have end-to-end -end accessibility for this service that I'm just launching. And this is where our service accessibility primitive comes into play, where basically I'm specifying a set of services that I want people to be able to access. And again, if I look at this configure, I get to define the behavior before, after the change, which should have passed, the behavior before the change, something should fail, I've defined my service, service one, with these IPs in this application, and I've said I want it to be reachable from the internet. And once I do that, now I can go look at that and say, okay, let me look at the status before and after. And so it says before I made this change, it failed and it as expected to fail. And it also gives you insight into where, what happened. So it says the flow ends at the firewall, it was denied out. And I can click on this handy trace route link and what this is doing is Batfish is doing a virtual trace route through our model to show you how this packet would enter and exit the network. And here you can see that it, from the internet, it can come into either one of my ISP peers, into either one of my border routers. If I was to look at one of the border routers, I can see that it's getting filtered. So there's an input filter, but it's being permitted by that filter because it matches this rule, permit HTTPS. And then we make a routing decision. We match this slash 16, learn via VGP from the firewall, and we send it to the firewall. And border two is going to do the same thing. But now when I look at the firewall, I can see, yep, I have a routing entry. I'm going to match. But my filter step fails. And if I look at the details, I can see there's just no match. So it didn't find a permit rule in this cross zone policy from outside to in, uh, inside, and therefore it dropped the packet. So this is all useful information. I can sort of see how things are traversing. Uh, I go back to my policy view. So it's sort of as expected. HTTPS should at least get to the firewall. And then the firewall is going to make more granular decisions on which endpoints are listening to HTTPS and which ones aren't. Now I can see after the change, uh, it passes as I expected it to pass. It gets it, the flow ends at least 40. And again, I can pop into this handy trace route view to see the full end to end path. And you can see here that at the firewall, now what I see is rather than it being dropped because there's no match, it matches this new rule I created for ticket one. And again, well, our processing is fully stateful, so uh, we don't have a NAT transformation in this uh, example, but we do create sessions. So if there's a NAT transformation, we transform the headers and we track that session. And this is because we can actually show end-to-end -end flows. So, uh, I'll, and I'll come back to that in a second. So, you know, in, once we make this firewall change, we can see what happens in the rest of the network. We can see that the firewall is now routing that packet to the border leaf. The border leaf is now uh, routing to a slash 24 taking it to leaf 40. Uh, and I can see that it's got four-way ECMP to the spine. But if I go back to this firewall, the setup session step is important uh, because not only can I look at traffic in uh, a single direction, I can actually track it bi-directionally. So I can use this trace route view. And again, I can get to this trace route view without having to use the change review. Uh, it's a top level uh, uh, application in the, in the dashboard. So if I run this here, 
what this is now going to show me is, you know, I've got this flow that I'm going to play out in the forward direction. So from the internet to that destination, and I can see it gets delivered. And then I also get to see the return saying, okay, you know, it's an HTTPS packet, it, you know, will packets come back? And I can see that from the leaf, it's going to go to one of the spines, one of the border leaves. If I go back at the firewall, I can see that I'm now matching this session, uh, which just for completeness sake, you'll see is the same session I, I generated over here. And that's how I know the traffic's going to go through. On the border, there's no output firewall and it gets delivered to the internet. And so the cool thing is not only can you, and if you think about if you're trying to debug this in the real network and you did a trace route or a ping, you'd get partial information. You only get to see one of the hops, not the UCMP path. You'd only get to see if the packet, you know, how the packet is getting there, nothing about whether or not the return uh, flow would actually get completed. Versus in this, in our simulation, in our modeling, we can show you both of that because we are fully aware of the state that's being created. All right, so let's go back to uh, our change review. So here, what we see is that my two test cases or my validation uh, steps, as we like to call them, my pre and post change checks pass. But I also have this notion of network policies that I sort of talked about uh, when, uh, earlier. Uh, and what I have here is I've defined nine network policies. And what Batfish is telling me in this view is that all nine of them were passing before the change and they're still passing after the change. And so, again, this is important because I, once I validated that the change is going to have the very specific impact I want it to have, that's allowing this new service, I also want to make sure that it's not violating any other policies I have. Uh, and if you look at some of these policies, again, there's a lot of different primitives. Let me look at one of these. I'll show you uh, the route policy primitive. So if I go here, uh, this is what you can see is that the policy is very simple. I have a devices have routes primitive that I can specify in YAML. And I'm just telling that they're saying, hey, you know, I expect there to be a default route learned via BGP in the default birth on all devices that uh, match this regex leaf.star. And basically, in this case, I expect it to pass before and after the change because this is my network policy. I don't expect the status to change. Uh, and Batfish is telling me, yep, everything passes. All my leaves have you know, default routes and oh, even better, they're full ray UCMP, so life is good. Uh, same thing after. And then I also have, uh, you know, more end-to-end -end, uh, sort of policy that I can specify. Accessibility of inter external services. So this is taking that service accessibility uh, test case I created, and I'm turning this into a policy saying, hey, you know what? I need to make sure that all my servers connected to LEAF 1, VLAN 101, have access to Google DNS, Cloud Store DNS, and AWS, because I need it for my application to function. And so I've defined this as my network policy, it's my service accessibility policy. And then now Batfish is going to analyze this every time there's a network change, every time there's a new snapshot. So now that the policies are all passing, there's one other thing that I can look at here to make a decision on whether or not I still think everything is, uh, is copacetic and the change is good. It's this compare view. So what this is giving you is a very curated, you know, network behavior diff uh, for this change. So it's telling you, hey, this is the raw config that I changed. No surprise there, that's what we have up here. It's telling me one device was impacted because I made this one change. But what it's also showing me is no interfaces have been impacted. No routing protocols have been impacted by this change. No routes have been impacted by this change, which is all good because again, I'm making a firewall policy change. I won't expect any of these other impacts to be present. Uh, but I do see this reachability change. And so we can dig into what that looks like. And so while that data is coming back, the way to think of this reachability change is that fish understands, once it's done its modeling and simulation, it knows all the flows that the network will carry from any given port to any other given port. So if you think of your network as you know, input ports, output ports, you know, you've got this matrix of flows that can go between any port. So you think of a, a flow matrix. And Batfish computes that for the, what's running in production. And then it computes the delta of that for the change snapshot. And that's what you see here. And what this is telling you is, hey, uh, after this change, the network is going to carry some new flows. I've added flows. That's why it's blue here. From the internet to the data center in Portland. Uh, look at, I can dig into that thing. It's okay. Specifically, the traffic is going to some leaf routers. Specifically, it's going to leaf 40 and leaf 41. I can dig into leaf 40. Again, it's specifically for servers connected to VLAN 240. And if I dig into that some more, I can see that it's only TCP443. 
Similarly, if I go back up the stack and look at LEAF 41, it's only going to VLAN 241, and again, it's TCP 443 for the subnet connected to that. So now I know concretely the flow impact as well. So let's say I didn't have as many policies, you know, I'm, I'm getting started, I'm starting to express more policies, express more validation cases. You know, you can always look at this comparison view and sort of get an insight into the behavior diff that you would see. Uh, and all of these things are things that, you know, most of common things that you do today, right, in a maintenance window. You look at the routes before and after the, uh, the change. You'll look at the routing protocol status before and after the change. You'll compare interface status, et cetera. Uh, you can do all of that here, but obviously this is all in our sandbox. It's no, it hasn't touched production. There's been no impact. But then the cool thing that you get that you can't get anywhere else is this notion of this reachability matrix diff that shows you exactly what the flow impacts are. And so here, if there were more than these two flow impacts, then I would go back and say, hey, maybe this change is incorrect. But at this point, you know, the change is looking pretty good to me. I think it's time for us to go approve that change uh, and move into the rest of the workflow. So I'm going to pass it over to Mike so that he can well, we can walk through the rest of the workflow that we've built in IAP. And where am I stuck? There we go. Alrighty, thanks, Samir. It, it's awesome to see how much level to see the level of detail that's in Batfish Enterprise there, and how I can feel really confident as a network engineer that my change is good to go. As we mentioned earlier, we set this up with a manual approval step, but given all the rules and all the policies and everything that's been built in the Batfish, and with all network automation, it's typically a crawl, walk, run approach. Run approach. So we could, as we start out, continue to do a manual process there look at all that validation before we make our network change. Um, but as we evolve and mature within our automation strategy, we can decide, you know what, look, I'll take the results coming back from Batfish and I'll say, Batfish computed the success, I get used to that, and then I can just skip the manual approvals here and consider this a fully end-to-end -end automated flow without having to pause for that manual. But the option is totally up to the implementer here. I'm gonna click on work the task here since we did pause for the manual. I've got the link back to Batfish Samir gave us a deep demo there, so I won't worry about going into it. And I'm gonna mark the change as approved. If I pop back into Visualize, I'll see the flow continue to work. I also wanna jump into the firewall and catch it before it makes the change so I can show everyone out here that, hey, right now, from a security perspective, we've got the 12 rules. That's gonna increase. We're planning on building out a new role here for our firewall policy. Um, we've also decided to set up some actions, some objects based on the data coming in uh, from our automation. Ticket one was created here as a group for the addresses with ticket one and ticket two as the sub addresses there. And then we've also got a service and service group that we've been setting up to correspond with our change. Here's our new service so I can see things progressing. And if I pop back into our policy, ultimately we're looking for the addition, which is ticket one that's been created here. So it looks like we've also stamped this in here, created from our job back to Itential to keep a reference point. And if I hop over to Itential, we can see it's still working on that process there. It's probably going through the commit on Palo Alto. It takes just a few moments. As we're waiting on that, I'll jump into our Slack messages and see how our notifications have been, have been progressing. So we can see here after we clicked on the approval, it's been approved and being deployed. And now that it's been committed, we can see that it has been deployed and we're now initiating the post deployment validation with Batfish Enterprise. So we wanna surround the change with both the pre checks and the post checks just to make sure everything is copacetic as Samir had mentioned. It's gone ahead and completed that part. Um, again, I can dig into these and get to the detail, but we'll keep it at the top level for here. We've gone through the Slack messages, we've pulled some additional configuration from the devices, and we've done our post snapshot in Batfish Enterprise so that we have a pre-post comparison. Wrapping up on the Slack message, so I'll climb up here, and it looks like everything has been fully addressed and our entire workflows reached the end. All right, as we saw between combining uh, the validation and verification, with Batfish and the automation from Itential, combining both of those create a powerful solution. We're closing the loop and we're increasing velocity and it'll reduce the time it takes to make the network changes and give you the comfort that it's been done correctly. 
All right, so we had a few questions come in during our presentation, so we'll go through some of those now. There was a question, seems like a lot of things going on with the automation. How long does it take to build that out? The beauty of the Itential Automation platform is that things are modular, so it really turns into stitching the pre-builds together. When we did this uh, demonstration for our firewall use case, the beauty of it was we already had Slack integrations and Slack pre-builds. We had ServiceNow pre-builds ready to go. We had Palo Alto as a pre-built. So when we combined all of this, it was really to work with Samir and the IntentionNet team to build out a Batfish pre-built to couple that to the solution. After we combined the pre-builds together, we were left with a few steps to combine the business to uh, integrate that business process so our demonstration could work, right? Because every organization does things a little bit differently. In our demonstration here, we set up and said, here's where we wanna do Slack, here's when we wanna do ServiceNow, here's when we wanna orchestrate the changes and coupled that with the validation of Batfish on both ends of that. So to answer the question, uh, the automations turn into taking minutes and hours to create, not days or weeks, plus everyone can do them, which is really powerful. Um, you can get teams from your firewall groups in here. You can get your um, your ServiceNow teams involved. All these different teams, not just the ones we demonstrated today, but it essentially becomes a platform where lots of teams can jump in and contribute to automation since it's a matter of drag and drop. All right, how would we get? How would we recommend getting started with automations in Itential? So we typically have users build out automations from a process perspective. If you think about your business process and try to create the automation in the canvas. It makes it really easy to do that. Um, don't even worry about the functional parts of making it really work. Just try to capture that business process that's in your mind and with your teams, get it built out. There's even a, a task called stub that lets users kind of stub out then mock up their business process. Once you have that mocked up and ready, then you can start swapping out some of those stub tasks for actual working tasks. And uh, definitely recommend taking the essential training. There's a, a learning plan for getting started and a good overview set of courses as well. Saw a list of your adapters, but you're missing my IPAM system. How does that get added? So Itentials invested a lot of R&D into our adapter framework. We actually read through open API specs, Postman collections, protobuf files, and other sources to automatically build integrations to systems. We make it really easy to convert APIs to drag and drop blocks, and there's even an adapter uh, builder available on our website. Um, you noticed as well, we had the gRPC Batfish Enterprise adapter that was built when uh, Samir and team shared with us their protobufs. We were able to read through those files and just create the adapter uh, and make that available to our demonstration today. Samir, there's a question over here. How easy is it to get started with policies in Batfish? Or are there predefined policies uh, customers use? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's really easy to get started with policies. As I mentioned, you know, we've built this no code policy framework. So all you have to do is sort of specify policies in, in, the, in YAML, uh, and they're very simple primitives, and so we're constantly adding new primitives as we sort of expose new test cases to customers. But it's, it's very simple to use that YAML uh, framework and specify these policies. And we do have a set of uh, pre-canned ones. You know, what I showed you here was sort of policies that I built specifically for this network, uh, but we also have a library of what we call insights and recommendations. So based on the configs that we see, Batfish will generate certain policies for you saying, hey, you know, we think this policy is relevant for your network based on your design, or we, you know, we think this is a common thing that we've used in other customers. This is something you should use as well. Uh, so we're trying to, we're sort of investing in that inside a recommendation path as well, but also, you know, just making sure that the policy framework and the primitives are very easy to use. Awesome. Thank you. There's a question. You showed me Palo Alto firewalls, but what other platforms do you support in Batfish? Um, Batfish is truly multi-vendor, so on the, from a firewall standpoint, we've got support for Palo Alto firewalls, Juniper SRXs, Cisco ASAs, uh, Fortinet, uh, FortiGate firewalls, Checkpoint, uh, and it's pretty, we, you know, we add new platforms as we engage with different customers uh, to meet their needs. And then from the routing and switching side, we have all the major vendors you'd expect to see, Cisco, Juniper, Arista, uh, uh, Cumulus, and all their different variations of their OSs, et cetera. You know, especially Cisco with NXOS, iOS, iOS XR. So all of those things are supported. And again, it's it's multi-vendor by uh, uh, from the beginning, and it's you know we add new platforms as we sort of engage with customers and see new requirements, new topologies, new network architectures. All right. There's a question: How are the changes being made 
to Palo Alto API integration directly from Itential. So for today's particular demonstration, we actually leveraged the uh, Panos, the Palo Alto Galaxy modules that are available from Ansible. Um, there's a number of different ways you can connect to it. Uh, from customer implementations, we do Panorama from time to time. We do the, as I mentioned, Palo Alto through the, through the firewall directly. Um, you can leverage NetMiko. The platform supports all of those. Uh, in the lab particularly here, as we did the demonstration, I didn't have Panorama available, so we leveraged the firewall directly. But from an implementation perspective, we always recommend to the customers, uh, take the, the most intelligent way to connect to your network. So if you are leveraging a controller, that's nine times out of 10, the preferred route to go. So it depends on the implementation that you've got set up in your environments, but we could connect from any different uh, number of methods. And then Samir, I think the, the last question is for you. What's the difference between Batfish and Batfish Enterprise? Yeah, so the way we sort of look at the distinction is uh, Batfish, uh, sort of the open source version, has all the multi-vendor device, uh, you know, parsing and configuration parsing. It sort of builds the device models, the vendor, uh, and it does the routing and forwarding simulation. So this is sort of the baseline that you get. Uh, and then it has a Python SDK that you used to interact with it. Uh, and then the enterprise uh, version sort of layers a bunch of new capabilities on top of that. Uh, most of them you can see through the UI. Uh, there's a language agnostic gRPC API set, which you saw that we used to create this pre-built. And then in the UI, there's a number of different applications. There's this change UI workflow. There's the, uh, there's the trace route uh, application I showed you, and there's a few others that we didn't get to today. Uh, and so that's the other part that sort of gets layered on top of it. And then obviously service and support and you know all the enterprise features you'd want like SSO with SAML, role-based access control. Uh, and then you know those policies and insights and recommendations. So the policy language we talked about, the no-code environment, that's all part of enterprise. So those are these primitives that we built into enterprise uh, that aren't part of open source. And you know we're happy to support customers on either journey. You know the open source. You know the customers for that are for more ideal for open source are going to be very Python savvy you know, can do a lot of their own uh, sort of policy specification definition, sort of uh, look at fully automated workflows, everybody's sort of uh, code comfortable. Uh, and then we see the enterprises that are very useful and sort of targeted at mixed teams where you've got some people that are, you know, driving the automation that can help build out these workflows, you know, either through IAP or through other systems with some custom code, but then they want to expose this to, to the broader team where you can come in, you can initiate change of use manually, you can initiate change of use through automation, you can interact with the models from Batfish either uh, programmatically or through the UI. Uh, and so that's where we see the split. So the teams that sort of have that mixed need tend to go for enterprise. Awesome. And that, that covers the questions that were popped in today. I want to thank everyone for the participation and engagement today. Samir, I want to thank you and your team for a great partnership. It's uh, been awesome to combine the technologies and solution together. Um, hopefully everyone found the webinar very insightful and valuable. If you want to go to the itential.com page, it should be easy to go out there and, and you can look through the pre -builds. You can see things such as we covered today, plus uh, even some of the questions, Panorama and some other areas and how you could integrate to. There's pre -builds available there. And um, if you're interested in trying the itential automation platform, you can check it out at itential.com slash free dash trial. And uh, so I want to thank everyone. Have a great day. And Samir, I'll give you a moment to wrap up as well. So please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's been it's been a pleasure working with you and the team putting this demo together. You know, it's it, network automation has come such a uh, such a long way from when I think we started this journey many many moons ago. I remember the days of Perl and expect scripts and like being able to see this platform where you can drag and drop and integrate you know disparate systems into sort of a holistic workflow and just make that so easy for the customers is great. And you know we're excited about adding that validation component to it. So you know, because in the end, you know, automation gives you sort of speed and consistency and scale and validation completes the picture by giving you that correctness component. And so uh, it comes full circle and it's sort of exciting to see where we go from here. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about Batfish Enterprise, you know, hit us up at intentionally.com. If you want to see a, a more detailed demo, uh, there's a free demo link there that you can go to and we'll set up a time to sort of demonstrate the product in more detail to you and your team. And then you have more questions, you can reach out to me uh, or you can reach out to info at intention.com. So again, hey, thank you everybody for taking the time and spending this almost one hour with us today. And you know, we hope to hear from you guys soon and uh, please reach out if you have any questions.